Welcome to the New Testament Review, where every episode we discuss an influential piece of New Testament scholarship. I'm Ian Mills. I'm Laura Robinson. And today we're discussing Hindi Nyman's Seconding Sinai, the Development of Mosaic Discourse in Second Temple Judaism. This book was published in 2003. Laura, what's this book about? So what what Hindi Naiman is investigating in this book is a kind of Jewish writing that she calls mosaic discourse. And this is the phenomenon of Jewish writers interpreting and expounding on Torah in a way that was specifically inspired by Deuteronomy to make mosaic legislation relevant to their own context and also to claim a level of authority for their own interpretations that goes back to the original Torah. There is this type of literature in ancient Judaism that people have called rewritten Bible or rewritten scripture and Professor Nyman is focusing in on a subset of this which she is proposing a category for. The category is mosaic discourse. And this category of literature, according to Nyman, has four characteristics. It reworks and expounds older traditions. It ascribes itself the status of Torah, of being the law of Moses. It is a representation of the Sinaitic event, that is, the event whereat God reveals the law to Moses. And it associates itself with the person and status of Moses, the original lawgiver. Um, so th- that might have sounded like a lot of details, and I hope it'll start to make more sense and come out in the wash a bit once we start talking about the books in which this shows up. The important through line with this is that when Jewish writers engage with Torah and interpret it to make it relevant to their own context, they don't represent themselves as rewriting the tradition or re or redefining the tradition or rejecting the previous tradition. Even though we might say as interpreters that that's exactly what they're doing, they don't say they're doing that. They don't make that claim about themselves. Rather, they make the claim that what they're doing has always been Torah. Their interpretation has always been the true expression of what Torah is. Right. Let's say, you know, you're a you're a Second Temple Jew and you are trying to decide whether or not it's okay for Jewish people to marry non-Jewish people. Okay, this is not something that's clearly said in Torah one way or another. How do you do this? How do you make your interpretation? Let's say you don't want Jewish people to be marrying non-Jewish people. What do you do about it? Well, you don't say that Ezra said this. You don't say that Nehemiah said this. You said Moses said this. This was Moses' teaching. You go back and you assign it to Mosaic status. Right. Spoiler warning, that is an example from the very last chapter of Nyman's book, where she points out, as so many others have, that Ezra and Nehemiah attribute to the law of Moses things that are not in any Pentateuchal book. Right. Um, But let's, let's back up a little bit here. What is Second Temple Judaism, and why do we have any business covering this on a podcast ostensibly reviewing influential works of New Testament scholarship. So what do we mean when we're talking about Second Temple Judaism? This is basically, this is an era of Judaism. It's also called early Judaism, where we start to see the formations of uh, the Jewish tradition as we now know it, and also the the sort of Judaism that would have been operating at the time that Jesus was alive. You might say, wait a second, Laura, the foundations of Judaism are in the Old Testament. Well, yes and no. So obviously the Hebrew Bible is a foundational text for both the early Christian movement and rabbinic Judaism. But a lot of features shared in common by both traditions have their origin not in the Pentateuch by any means, or even in some of the prophets, but in this period of maybe three centuries or so before the turn of the millennium. So technically Second Temple Judaism begins in the 6th century, at the end of the 6th century, when the temple is rebuilt. But what we're talking about today is really two or three centuries during which a sort of Jewish canon begins forming, during which we have Hellenization, Um, the scriptures are translated into Greek, Platonic ideas, and other, you know, other vaguely Greek ideas intermix with the varieties of Judaism, and during which notions of, like, afterlife and a devil, and things like that, which which are part of both Christianity and contemporary or rabbinic Judaism, but don't really have much of a foundation in the Hebrew Bible. 
when we're talking about like the, the you know the Jewish roots of the New Testament, for instance, or the Jewish um the Jewish environment from which the New Testament emerged, it's really important to remember that what what is forming this environment is not just the raw uninterpreted text of the five books of Moses, right? It is this era of interpretation and um, culturally re reinventing Judaism or sort of inventing it for the first time, even depending on how you want to see it, is that it's in this era of trying to figure out how these texts are relevant to this new environment after the return of the from exile and dealing with these new imperial powers. Yeah. Laura and I are both getting our PhDs in New Testament. Part of doing that means spending a lot of time studying Second Temple Judaism yeah. and the varieties of Jewish belief and practice in this period. So, this book doesn't discuss the New Testament, but it does discuss Philo, who is a contemporary of the New Testament authors and really important for understanding the New Testament. It does discuss yeah. Jubilees and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I would certainly claim that our understanding of the New Testament, even on the level of just like lexicography, how words are being used, yeah. is massively informed by the Second Temple Jewish texts. And of course, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls produced a revolution in understanding Paul's theology and the rest. Yeah. I mean, it's important to note that when we're talking about the way in which the New Testament receives Hebrew Bible traditions, it's not just the Hebrew Bible they're receiving and responding to and interpreting. It's also these other Second Temple texts that we're talking about. So traditions that are that show up in in other Second Temple texts like Jubilees or Philo, a lot of times those are actually the ones that New Testament writers are receiving and responding to rather than just the text of Torah itself. And this isn't an example from Nyman, but there's all sorts of fun examples of this where Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 talks about the rock following the Israelites mm -hmm. in the desert. That's not in the Bible, but we do find that in lots of Second Temple Jewish texts. Right. Similarly, Galatians seems to assume that the snake seduced Eve. Again, not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. In Second Temple Jewish texts, uh, Jude refers to Enoch. There's lots of examples of this. Yeah. So that's Second Temple Judaism. That's why this matters. That's why this. Uh, that's why this book is showing up on a New Testament show. You can't really understand the New Testament unless you understand Second Temple Judaism, the the uh, the the world of texts and traditions that the New Testament authors are receiving. Our goal here is to introduce some of these books and these traditions to our audience because if you want to understand the New Testament, this is part of the field. Yeah. So now that we've done that, let's talk about Hindi Nyman's argument. Nyman's claim is that there is a kind of discourse that is a way of talking uh, in Second Temple Judaism that when you want to say something about Jewish practice, you don't say, Rabbi Ian says you should do this. What you say instead is that Moses told us we should do X. Even if X is not found in your received scriptures or not X is what your received scriptures in fact tell you to do. So one of the consequences of this is that this has some very obvious implications for how we think about the phenomenon of pseudepigraphy. So pseudepigraphy in the ancient world is the practice of writing your own work and putting it under the name of somebody else. And there's some debates about how to see this in, the, in antiquity. Uh, one is that this is a kind of forgery, that we should see this as people who are trying to trick their audience into thinking they have the authority of a different figure rather than their own. The other side, and this is where Nyman is going to be coming down, is that pseudepigraphy was an accepted practice that you could write in the name of a revered teacher or authority figure, and writers weren't, in fact, expecting their readers to believe that Moses was actually writing this. Nyman is going to be arguing that that's what we see in Mosaic Discourse, that the author of Jubilees, the author of the Temple Scroll, didn't expect their readers to actually believe this was Moses. They were instead participating in a well-known discourse of writing as if they were Moses in order to interpret Moses. In support of this, she appeals to uh, a tradition from Iamblichus um, that is really well known. Iamblichus says that the Pythagoreans wrote in the name of Pythagoras to honor him, also, she appeals to a passage where Tertullian says that the Gospel of Luke is really Paul's Gospel you're, because you write with the authority of your teacher. Now, I think both of these examples are really, really problematic. This book was written before Ehrman's forgery and counterforgery, 
Although I have to say it was also written after Wolfgang Speyer's important book arguing the same thesis as Ehrman. I don't think either of these examples, Iamblichus or Tertullian's works, uh, Iamblichus doesn't know anything about the practice of the Pythagorean school writing 800 years before him, and Tertullian continues to call it Luke's gospel. He doesn't think Paul wrote this gospel. He's just saying Paul is the source of Luke's authority. And uh, we're going to talk about this more a little bit later, but if you look at the way ancient readers received pseudepigraphs, they universally either think it is authentic and therefore accept it, or think it's inauthentic and therefore reject it. Um, you don't have any readers in antiquity consciously acknowledging that this is a pseudepigraph and uh, being okay with that. So at least I have this fundamental disagreement with Nyman. I still think Nyman's work is really, really useful, but as an analytic category rather than an actor's category. And I'll talk about that more at the end of this episode. So while I have this fundamental disagreement with the nature of pseudepigraphy, I still think her category of mosaic discourse, or at least the group of practices and behaviors that she draws attention to, are still really useful to think with. So we'll come back to that more later. When Nyman says that someone is writing in Moses' name, the claim Nyman is making is not that the author is trying to trick you into thinking that this is what Moses actually said. The author is writing in the tradition of Moses, and everybody knows that's what you're doing, and that's okay. Whereas, I think the author is definitely trying to trick you. The concept that Nyman is specifically responding to is the language in the academy of the rewritten bible the idea that in the second temple period we have people taking biblical traditions and rewriting them for their own audiences and nyman argues that this is anachronistic because it assumes a level of authority and completion and closure that we assume when we use the word bible that nyman argues that that's not really helpful these are all received texts and people are responding and interpreting to them the other thing that Nyman is arguing is that there's a debate where we're talking about rewritten scriptural traditions over whether the goal of rewriting is to replace the text that you're responding to or to supplement it. The catchy way to say this is to, supplant, um, is to supplement or supplant. One big part of why Nyman doesn't like the category rewritten Bible is because it suggests that the goal is to supplant the original text, right? So when you rewrite a draft of your thesis, you don't keep the original draft. The goal is that you have the second one. It, Nyman argues that the purpose of these texts is not to replace what went before them, but to supplement them and to be read alongside them. Nyman is coming down hard on the idea that the purpose of Mosaic Discourse is to supplement what came before it, but people argue about this. And as we go through these three or four texts, we will note Nyman's particular arguments in favor of supplement versus supplant. It's worth noting, just as an aside here, if we take this as an analytic category and not an actor's category, Mosaic Discourse, then... There's no reason to think that all of these authors had to think they were doing the same thing. You can both agree with Nyman that there is a through line through Second Temple Jewish literature that you have to root your claim to authority in Moses, and also believe that different texts were trying to do different things relative to their source material. And rewritten Bible, of course, encompasses things beyond the Mosaic Discourse. So I'm actually persuaded by Nyman that... The texts discussed here, for the most part, are trying to supplement their sources, not supplant. But this doesn't mean that another example of rewritten scripture, say, for instance, the Samaritan Pentateuch, isn't trying to supplant instead of supplement. Yeah. So to introduce us to this concept of mosaic discourse, Nyman starts with Deuteronomy. And this is what Nyman says is the beginning of mosaic discourse as we uh, um, as it develops in the Second Temple era. So where did Deuteronomy come from? Well, there's a discovery narrative of Deuteronomy in the book of Second Kings. There's a 7th century political reform under King Josiah, and Josiah's priests find the book of Moses in the temple, they bring it out, and they read it to the people. And scholars generally assume that this book that was apparently found in the 7th century, this is Deuteronomy. This is the, uh, the, the, the first rewriting of Moses that the, that the priests find and becomes the, the basis of Josiah's reforms. 
there are lots of really good reasons to believe this. We don't have time to outline them all to you, but basically the things that Josiah reforms, lots of them are things that Deuteronomy corrects relative to Exodus. So Exodus says to do one thing, Deuteronomy says to do another thing. And Second Kings tells us that Josiah's discovery yeah. of the scroll is the reason these new Deuteronomy-like reforms were implemented. For instance, um, because it's relevant to Nyman's discussion, uh, the centralized cult that you can't offer sacrifices or worship at temples anywhere but in Jerusalem, you'll find that the heroes of Israel's past are making sacrifices at mountain shrines and all over the place, uh, whereas Deuteronomy puts on the lips of Moses that you will only offer sacrifices to God at the place where I will show you, which is, of course, Jerusalem. Also, as Bernard Levinson has argued in a series of really remarkable publications, Deuteronomy revises several of the Jewish festivals to reflect this newly centralized Josiah-esque vision of Israelite worship. Right, yeah. So Levinson argues that what is happening between Deuteronomy and Exodus is that Deut the author of Deuteronomy intends his book to replace Exodus. That both books claim to be in, in the, the voice of Moses. Both books make claims that are not compatible with each other. Therefore, Levinson argues Deuteronomy is written to replace Exodus and be the definitive law. Levinson was one of my undergraduate mentors, and I think you will not find a better example of really careful philological work, really methodologically sensitive historical work, and just scholarly charity than Bernard Levinson. I think the absolute world of him and his scholarship. That said, I think Nyman makes a really compelling case here for the supplement perspective over and against Levinson. Nyman points out that Deuteronomy's frame narrative, the I, Moses, in Deuteronomy 3, this frame narrative actually assumes something like the Exodus narrative. You have to yeah. know something about this story to get Deuteronomy. And while you might appeal to oral tradition, from Levinson's own argumentation, we know that Deuteronomy is using something very much like Exodus in textualized form. It is carefully reworking the Exodus tradition and even preserving some of the lexical information from the forms of Exodus that we can reconstruct with the manuscripts, carefully preserving some of these things that are dissonant with the new argument that Deuteronomy is making. So, for instance, in one of the festivals, Deuteronomy still allows you to kill the animal locally, um, but then you have to bring it and sacrifice it at the centralized location. And this isn't the sort of thing you do if you are just making this up out of oral tradition. Um, this is the sort of thing you do if you are trying to carefully preserve a previous text. And I guess I can actually use this a little bit to push back against Nyman's. Nyman has a couple paragraphs suggesting that we don't know to what extent Exodus was already textualized in a recognizable yeah. form. And while that's true, obviously there may be variations that we don't know and can't reconstruct. Deuteronomy's preservation of details from the text of Exodus as we have it, as Levinson has demonstrated, makes a really good case that Exodus was already textualized in a recognizable form to what we can recover now. And Nyman also notes that Deuteronomy and Exodus circulated alongside each other. So this suggests that at least some early readers thought that these texts could supplement each other and could go alongside each other quite well. The reason why this text, though, Nyman argues, becomes the basis of how people interpret Moses and use Mosaic discourse is that Deuteronomy ends with the claim. So after it goes through and reinterprets Exodus and makes all these, um, all these definitive claims about what actually happened at Sinai, and what the law was, Deuteronomy closes by saying that there has never been another prophet like Moses who God spoke with face to face. It gives Moses this really unique, one-of-a-kind role in Jewish history. So it makes Moses this exclusive and ultimate mediator figure that sets the standard for what's going to happen when people interpret the Torah in the future. It's got to go through this guy. He's the one. Right. So, Deuteronomy wants to update Moses to reflect this new centralized cult, and what it does is it puts its words on the lips of Moses. Fast forward about 400 years, and we get the book of Jubilees. This is also called the Little Genesis, and this was a hugely influential work not only in Second Temple Judaism, but on early Christians. The Ethiopic Orthodox Church even still has it as part of their scriptures. 
This is the fourth most popular book in all of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jubilees was written by a Pharisaic Jew, probably a Pharisee, um, during the Maccabean period. And it presents itself as a revelation to Moses, as a book that was apparently written by God or some supernatural observer, um, that was revealed to Moses at Sinai. And the book re-narrates Genesis, but does a lot of updating to address controversies we know were live during the Maccabean period. Jubilees makes a really big deal out of the calendar, which was an issue of pretty considerable uh, dispute in the in, in the Second Temple Jewish world, uh, specifically the calendar on which, according to which Jewish, fe- Jewish festivals ought to be celebrated. Uh, Jubilees makes a really strong case for its calendar and is very insistent on this. So again, we're talking about this problem of how do we interpret this text? How do we resolve disputes about how to practice Torah in our own age? Well, we go back and we assign them to most. Moses. This is the calendar that Moses gave us. Another big distinctive trait of Jubilees is the role of Mastema. Uh, Mastema is a Satan figure in this book who is a uh, instigator and a and and, uh, and basically plays the role that Christians will eventually come to recognize as Satan in a way that this Satan concept doesn't exist in the book of Genesis. So Mastema is a big instigator of the, um, of the sacrifice of Isaac, for instance, right? You know, Satan is not involved at all in the Genesis version of that story, but Mastema is, um, Massima is shamed at this. He he's the instigator of it. He is the one who is trying to prove that Abraham won't be able to do it, and then he is humiliated by this, and he gives this big rationale for why this need to happen to shame Massima. So, Nyman also is going to argue that Jubilees is supplementing, not supplanting, received traditions, particularly Genesis, on these fronts. Uh, and her argument primarily is that Jubilees, in several places, refers to the received law. Um, I think in two different places, Jubilees seems to explicitly appeal to other traditions that we know from the book of Genesis, and therefore expects its readers to be familiar with both. The other early Palestinian text that Naaman cites as an example of a mosaic discourse is the Temple Scroll. Uh, the Temple Scroll is the longest of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was actually not recovered at Qumran. It has kind of a crazy discovery story. Uh, it was purchased from an antiquities dealer in 1967. Uh, it is generally scholarly consensus now that the original provenance of this text was Cave 11 at Qumran. Longest of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's even longer than the Great Isaiah Scroll from Cave 1, this is the Temple Scroll. So what is the Temple Scroll? Well, it starts with an exhortation that is a combination of Deuteronomy, of passages from Exodus and Deuteronomy, so hey, they did circulate together, uh, and then it leads into this extended original bit that doesn't really seem to clearly come from the Torah. This is specifically uh, the, a extended plan for how a uh, for the construction of a square temple that doesn't look like any of our temples that actually existed. Uh, it's definitely not the Jerusalem temple. Uh, it's a, a square temple with three concentric courtyards in it, and then it gives us a festal calendar. So again, calendar is subject of huge dispute, huge dispute in the ancient world. This is uh, these are the instructions of what the temple is supposed to look like and how the calendar will actually go. So we have another text addressing contemporary concerns during the two centuries before the turn of the millennium by rewriting previous scripture. The payoff of that introduction is that it looks like this text was supposed to have been given at Sinai. So I'll I'll tell you what we mean by that. Um, The author has eliminated the name of Moses from passages in Exodus and Deuteronomy. So we don't have Moses as this mediator figure. The, The effect of it is that the text is being dictated directly from God to the author. So instead of God says to Moses, God said, we just have the Moses part cut out. So so there. So what does this mean? What does it mean that uh, instead of Moses, we have the author receiving revelation directly from God? One is that this text is 
framing itself as the writing that is directly from Moses' own hand. This is exactly what Moses wrote down. Uh, Moses is taking notes as God says them, and then these are the notes that Moses eventually used to write Torah. Okay, so that's one explanation. The other explanation is that the author is claiming the same kind of authority that Moses might have had and is framing himself as a new Moses. So this would be a response to the tradition in Deuteronomy 18.15 that God will provide a prophet like Moses. We know that some people in the Second Temple era were really fascinated by this figure and, and were anticipating some sort of eschatological prophet like Moses. Nyman comes down on option number one, that this author is presenting himself as Moses and is taking this Moses role for themselves. So the overall effect of the temple scroll is to present a plan for the temple and to present a plan for the festal calendar that came directly from Moses' own hands revealed at Sinai. So again, classic example of mosaic discourse. This is what God said to Moses at Sinai, therefore this is the law of Moses. Next, Nyman turns to Philo of Alexandria. Philo was born in the 1st century BCE and died in the mid-1st century CE. This is where Nyman's analysis has come under some criticism in reviews of her work, because remember, it seems that Nyman is making the claim that this is an actor's category, that this is something that writers and readers were aware of in antiquity, And she claims that Philo's reinterpretation of the Torah in light of ideas about natural law um, and Platonic philosophy is another form of mosaic discourse. But, mind you, Philo isn't writing new scriptures. He isn't rewriting a new narrative which he's putting on the lips of Moses. He is instead making claims about what it means to interpret Moses and doing this at length in his works. And we'll talk about that in one second here. So Philo is famous for his allegorical interpretation of the Mosaic Law. Uh, He draws lessons about metaphysics and ethics and things like that from what look to us to be inconsequential details, numbers, um, and things like that in Torah, and grounds often these commands about, you know, ritual practice, things like circumcision, in what we might call his understanding of biology or physics. So, for instance, according to Philo, people, you get circumcised because it helps control, on a physiological level, control the passions. And this move, Nyman argues, Philo can make because he argues that the law is the perfect textualization of the law of creation, that they are two sides of the same coin. And so the first expression is creation, and the law comes as a way of ex- of textualizing that, of copying that out into words. But in practice, heuristically, this means Philo can use his understanding of nature and the cosmos to allegorically interpret the written law. So the, the norms for exactly how to understand Mosaic discourse, according to Nyman, do change a bit when you move from these Palestinian texts, like Jubilees and Temple Scroll, to Philo. But the thing that remains the same is the idea that there is something not new about the work that these authors are doing with Torah. And, um, and Nyman does make a distinction between Philo's interpretations and what Philo says Torah is. But for Philo, Torah is the written law that has always been true because it is the law of nature. So there is something older than the interpretive process happening here. There's something older than modern philosophy, modern Hellenistic philosophy, and what it tells us about reality. This is the way things have always been, and Moses reflects that. So the through line is the rejection of the concept of novelty, the rejection of the idea that people are responding to or rejecting Moses, that Moses is saying something timeless, and what the author is saying about Moses is timeless too. Right. And this is, I think, where it's really helpful to distinguish between actors and analytic categories. Yeah. Um, Because... If we understand this as an analytic category, that we are seeing that authors repeatedly claim to be old and claim to be bringing forth nothing new by appealing to Moses, we can see that Philo and Jubilees are doing the same thing in this one relevant way. However, Nyman's claim seems to be 
that in some important sense, Philo and Jubilees are representing themselves as doing the same thing. And this gets tricky because I think there's also a sense that's true, but it's in the sense that I already articulated as an analytic category. Philo is explicitly commenting upon, he's composing a commentary on Genesis. He is not writing the narrative of Genesis over again. And it's pretty obvious that there is a material and useful distinction to be made between the practices of Philo and the practices of the Temple Scroll. This brings us to chapter four, where Dr. Nyman talks about Ezra, Nehemiah, and the rabbis. And what she sees is some levels of continuity between Second Temple Judaism and, and the later rabbinic projects of trying to ground their, ground their interpretive work in the Mosaic tradition. And Dr. Nyman draws attention to some pretty well-known places in Ezra and Nehemiah where the post-exilic authorities are grounding their work and their decisions in authorities that they see as pre-exilic, namely Moses, are making laws and making norms for the new post-exilic world that they claim have always been the law and have always been this norm of Moses. And Nyman argues that this is really consistent with what we eventually see in rabbinic literature, that in rabbinic literature, we have this concept of oral Torah, the idea that at on Sinai, Moses got the written form of Torah, and then they also got, he also got the traditions of the fathers, this oral Torah that exists in the transmission of teacher to teacher. What Dr. Nyman is arguing is that this tradition of oral Torah is itself a kind of mosaic discourse. It's grounding the interpretive phenomenon in what was revealed at Sinai. Right, exactly. The rabbis can say this interpretation was revealed to Moses and then transmitted orally to me. So again, what we might call innovation, rewriting, revision, or even rejection is being grounded in the Sinaitic event. Yeah. Um, and she notes a really interesting like textual phenomenon, which is that the places where Jubilees invokes these heavenly tablets where Jubilees is attached to a particularly written kind of revelation being given to Moses in order to revise Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. The rabbis in this, the very same places invoke the oral Torah. And so we see here a shift in strategies between written and oral phenomena, but effectively doing the same thing with regard to her central claim about, about Mosaic discourse, that both approaches to reinterpreting the received traditions is making some claim about it being grounded in the Sinaitic event. The, the central thing that Nyman is drawing attention to is really valuable. That there is, the, the law of Moses remains this normative thing in going back and grounding your interpretation in this and saying that this has always been what Torah is. That that becomes really essential. And, and I, I think that's a really fascinating claim. And definitely revealing for when we get into early Jewish Christian disputes over the meaning of Torah and how Torah is to be practiced in these communities. The idea that you cannot reject Torah becomes really important for a lot of people. And I think that's um, I think that's a really interesting thing to pick up as a New Testament scholar. Yep, absolutely. So I've mentioned a few of my differences along the way. So far as we can tell, ancient readers believed Deuteronomy was written by Moses. They couldn't, therefore, have taken Deuteronomy as a precedent for writing conventionally recognizable pseudepigraphy. That is, they believe Moses wrote Deuteronomy. Therefore, it's hard to know how this could have inspired a genre which readers and writers would have approached with the expectation of pseudonymity. That said, I think Seconding Sinai is a is a really useful book on lots of fronts. It shows pretty compellingly that some forms of rewritten scripture are supplements and not attempts to supplant their sources. It demonstrates that really across a millennium, there is this conviction that innovation and rewriting and interpretation has to be grounded in Moses or God's revelation to Moses in an important sense. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it's just a really great introduction to a series of important Second Temple Jewish authors. Yeah, no, I think it's great. You should, I, I highly recommend this book. So yes, we both commend this book to you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Laura. Hey, so fun announcement, Ian. Laura, 
We uh, are breaking into a new medium. Some of you joined us for our YouTube live stream event a few weeks ago, and we had so much fun doing it that we decided we're going to make it a regular thing. But a little different. This will be the New Testament review after party. If we said something that you don't like or that you want to hear more about or you just want us want to expand on, come to the after party, come to the YouTube show, and you can, in the live chat, engage with us. We can have a, a conversation back and forth. Um, you can ask questions, you can offer pushback, that sort of thing there. And the plan for now is just to do an after party the night of our release for each episode. So once a month, we'll be able to discuss with you whatever book we reviewed. Awesome. And we can also just talk about the New Testament in general, just anything you guys are interested in. We can talk about past shows, but we're just going to, there's a new thing we're going to start doing. For sure. So come to the New Testament Review YouTube channel. We'll post links to this on our Twitter, and you can also just find it by going to YouTube and searching New Testament Review. Awesome. We're excited. We'll see you there. See you tonight.